You are a curse. The Black Widow. Next man who marries you is a dead man, like the others. Win riches! Exactly! Oh, you nasty bitch! Yes, cleaner than anything you've ever touched. Powers of water and intuition, hear us! Next needle I use will put a hole in your heart. There are other ways of opening you up. I grew up on white girl shit like charm and Sabrina the Teenage Cracker. I didn't know that there even were black witches. As it turns out, I'm an heir to Tituba. She was a house slave in Salem. She caught a demon in her. My granddaughter had a demon in her. They everywhere. Magic is more wrapped up in politics and race than you may think. For most of human history, magic has been as real a belief system as religion, and in this video, I want to discuss that from a black American perspective, while really zeroing in on black women. From misconceptions about the Salem witch trials to plantation magic and Harlem's hustlers, this video is laced with folklore, drama, and ghost stories to not only complement a black people's history of Halloween, but further contextualize black life, religion, and politics. It's Hoodoo History Month, so let's celebrate. Grab a snack, but not candy corn, and enjoy a black women's history of witchcraft, conjuring, and magic. For much of American history, the secrets of conjuring and magic were shrouded in secrecy. The practitioners and those seeking guidance cloaked in privacy. Secrecy and privacy, two things that are harder and harder to have in our modern digital society. As your data and browsing habits make your digital imprint more appealing to hackers and advertisers, have you ever considered the many magical uses of VPNs? Let me tell you about Surfshark. I was initially skeptical about VPNs until somebody broke it down for me. If you like going to public places to use Wi-Fi like I do all the time, Surfshark VPN encrypts your data on public networks, meaning you can get your work done and send sensitive stuff without getting your data stolen. But secrecy and security aren't the only benefits of Surfshark. If you travel often or live somewhere where certain sites are blocked, like you live in a red state that blocks pornography or wants to track if you're looking for reproductive care. Surfshark allows you to bypass all the BS and change your virtual location. Well, like magic. And if you're an online shopper, you can get the lowest prices because Surfshark won't let e-stores show you prices based on your location or device. If you're not satisfied, they even have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you go to the link in my description box, you can try Surfshark for 86% off and even get three extra months free. Just use my code intellectual. This magic VPN technology doesn't need to be a secret. Safeguard your digital privacy, get access to blocked websites, and get better online deals with Surfshark. One of the most inescapable misconceptions about black women in magic is that a central figure of the Salem witch trials was black. However, Tatuba, whom Elizabeth Hubbard and several other girls accused of witchcraft in February 1692, was actually an enslaved woman, likely from South America. However, there were two black servants named Candy and Mary Black who were accused of witchcraft. Black people were less than 1% of early New England, and the highest concentration was in Massachusetts. Bostonite clergymen, witch hunters, and writer Cotton Mather described black people in 1706s the Negro Christianized. Very many of them actually worship devils or maintain a magical conversation with devils. And all of them are more slaves to Satan than they are to you, until a faith in the Son of God has made them free indeed. Will you do nothing to pluck them out of the jaws of Satan the Devourer? This call to convert black people and also the indigenous people was strong because it was assumed that all non-Christian religions were demonic. White observers noted the use of magical talismans and charms of protection, divining, and a belief in ghosts as further proof that Africans worshipped Satan and were demonic. I hurt nobody. Who doth? I do not know, said Mary Black, who was accused in April 1692. She was wearing a pin in her neckcloth and was asked to remove it and repin it. When she did, several of the afflicted cried out they were pricked. Mary Walcott was pricked in the arm till the blood came. Abigail Williams was pricked in the stomach, and Mercy Lewis was pricked in the foot. Not much else is known about Mary except for that her enslaver Nathaniel Putnam got her off and she was cleared by January 1693. Nate's nephew Thomas Putnam just so happened to be a prominent accuser during the witch trials. Candy 
statement was from Barbados, and under questioning on July 4th, she blamed her white enslaver, Margaret, for allegedly making her sign her name in the Devil's Book. She said, Candy no witch in her country, Candy's mother no witch, Candy no witch, Barbados. This country, mistress give candy, witch. In her possessions was a handkerchief wherein several knots were tied, rags of cloth, a piece of cheese, and a piece of grass. When the knotted rag, likely a doll or poppet, was burned, it got weird. According to John Hale in 1702, I was credibly informed some compelled candy to swallow the grass, and that night was burnt in her flesh, and one took a piece of her rag and burnt it in the fire, and one of the afflicted that had complained of her was presently burned on the hand. Another piece of her rags was put under water, and then other complainants were choked and strive for breath as if underwater, and another ran to the river as if she would drown herself. What's interesting is that even with this confession and alleged magic, Candy was also jailed and then acquitted and released, while 25 white people ended up dying or being executed. Perhaps Arthur Miller sought to amalgamate the three women into one character in his 1953 play, The Crucible. Or more likely, he leaned into stereotypes about voodoo, giving Tatuba a live frog, a kettle, and chicken blood, and years of actual black witchcraft beliefs and magic tales passed down in the roughly 250 years following the trials of Tatuba, Candy, and Mary Black. Throughout chattel slavery, there were black people in and outside of the community believed to have the power. The power was known by different things in various regions and times. In the 17th century, it was cunning men, conjurers, and witches. By the 19th century, you were more likely to hear hoodoo, emerging in print as early as 1870, and root workers. Some people performed tricking, aka casting spells. People who trafficked in misfortune with their powers were trick doctors and witch doctors. If you hailed from Florida, South Carolina, or Georgia, Georgia, you'd hear conjure doctors, wise men, two-head doctors, long heads, and double siders. Perfect names for healers. Among the black populations in Louisiana and Mississippi, you'd hear about voodoos, wangaturs, and horses. No matter what word was used, the people who were believed to be available for injuring or destroying enemies, getting rid of rivals or undesirables, softening hearts, winning or holding love, breaking up homes, calling the absent, getting jobs, dodging the law, protecting property, detecting criminals, gambling, collecting debts, disciplining servants, stopping trains and steamboats, producing fertility or barrenness in women, promoting crops, controlling weather, foretelling the future, and locating lost and stolen goods, water, and buried treasure. Oh my god, that's a lot of responsibility. By the way, that quote was from the really excellent Black Magic, Religion, and the African American Conjuring Tradition by Yvonne P. Chirot. Even more folklore told of witches who could fly, shapeshift, or become invisible. There were stories about boo hags or skinless shapeshifting witches that slipped through key holes and windows. Unlike European witch lore, these witches didn't fly on broomsticks. They rode human beings like horses, draining their energy and sucking on their breath, but ultimately keeping them alive, unless they struggled. If you struggled, your skin might get stolen. Some folklore says the boo hags were the ghosts of conjurers. People were advised to keep Bibles around and sprinkle salt and pepper into corners of the room or on the skin of the hag, so that when it came to wear it, it'd be too uncomfortable to wear. I can't help but to mention that boo hags sound like a cool way to explain sleep paralysis before people understood what it was, and that various cultures have their version of sleep demons. Also, stories about shape-shifting witches and other creatures were excellent tales to tell small children, white or black, and black women's care to get them to behave. Like most folklore and beliefs, the ones of the enslaved served a purpose. Stories of root and conjure workers getting even with enslavers or exacting revenge were crucial parts of black American folklore and resistance. The ultimate power of those who dabbled in conjure magic, and voodoo was the sense of control they had during a time when black people were stripped of personhood and autonomy. Stories about strong practitioners could serve as pride and inspiration for dehumanized people. Magic and superstition are often utilized as a belief system to rationalize misfortune, similar to religion, and it's no wonder that all three concepts would flourish during the 400 years of chattel slavery, and even blend together and mingle with European beliefs about witchcraft. But whereas in the European tradition, witches were mostly associated with the devil and heresy, black people saw magic more ambiguously. Argued Yvonne P. Chirot, witches were often presented as being inherently harmful and wicked, where conjurers were more likely to have chosen revenge or to harm with the capacity for good. Another one of her central points is that black people practice conjure often along with Christianity, when one failed to meet needs that the other couldn't supply. Black pastors were noted to dabble in conjure to aid their flocks and would be the majority of the 
purported conjurers in the 18th and 19th century. White observers were appalled, with one folklorist calling their practices a horrible debasement of some of the highest and noblest doctrines of the Christian faith. Women, meanwhile, who were rearing and helping deliver children, seeing to injuries and providing emotional labor, used a plethora of items, tricks, and rituals to provide care to those around them, barter for goods or services, or make a little money on the side. In New England, a woman named Chloe Russell made bank divining the future. She was born in 1745, allegedly near Sierra Leone, enslaved and sold to a man in Virginia. After using her powers to help him find $60,000 his dead uncle had hidden, he bought her freedom and paid her $500. She then used the money to start a fortune telling business and buy a house, making her one of six black women in Boston to own property. She used her profits to buy freedom for other enslaved people according to a hotly debated biography in her 1827 dream book. Dream books had been around for centuries, giving interpretations of nighttime visions and guidance, but in the 19th century they were books by white people featuring racist depictions on the cover, like old Aunt Dinah. However, a real Chloe Russell did live in Boston at the time and own property, so I'm leaning on her publishing the book herself or at least having a part in it. We'll be back to divining and fortune telling later. The white planter Charles Colcock Jr. alleged that conjure women predominated in black communities in the coastal regions of Georgia and the Carolinas. It's no coincidence that this is where Gullah Geechee people lived. Because of a certain level of insular autonomy, the Gullah had more traditions directly from Africa. Cures like the life everlasting plant were given with magic utterances to add supernatural power and also placed around the home to ward off spirits and harm and they erected bottle trees to capture malevolent spirits. But everywhere, the enslaved heard or knew of people who were described to be born with the gift. Or in Frederick Douglass's description of Sandy Jenkins as a genuine African and had inherited some of the so-called magical powers said to be possessed by the Eastern nations. Sandy gave him a special route to carry in his pocket while fighting his white master and won. Staple ingredients for conjure workers included rabbit's feet, the bones of a black cat, red pepper, hair, nail, skin, bodily secretions, and roots like High John the Conqueror, which was often utilized in pouches known as mojo bags, grigri, lucky hands, and more. They were worn secretly on one's person for protection and also served to create fortune in life, love, gambling, or money. Conjurers employed various practices and fetishes with roots in Africa. Fetishes were items at the center of spiritual life, like divining objects, talismans, charms, or vessels believed to be holding spirits, like Grigri. Grigri from the Mende language meaning spiritual force. Back in pre-colonial Africa, people treated their charms with care and even provided offerings. In America, conjurers included Bible verses on their charms or fed them with a little whiskey or corn liquor. In various WPA narratives discussing folklore beliefs of formerly enslaved people, describe pouring out a little liquor for spirits to keep them at bay. This practice, called libation, has existed since ancient Egypt and has been common throughout the world. Years later, describing an incident in the early 1930s, Mrs. Emmeline Hurd of Georgia told a story in which a man's sweetheart died in a buggy accident next to him and began haunting him when he took his next sweetheart near where she died. Do you know that horse stopped right in front of that house and wouldn't budge one inch? No matter how hard he whipped that horse, it wouldn't move. Instead, he almost turned the buggy over. She said that he was then advised by an old slavery time man to pour a quart of whiskey around the buggy to make the hand leave which worked. One Patsy Moses of Fort Bend, Texas said she learned tricking from her enslaved father and mother, like how to make a good charm bag. Many of these kinds of items were found at excavated plantation sites. It makes sense that immediately after arriving into America, healers and conjurers who were pinnacles of their tribes and villages found similar ingredients or practices to take care of themselves and others. So conjurers were doctors, life coaches, and even could serve as an enforcer. Those with the power of divining were called on to find thieves or a betrayer in the community community for justice or retribution, which meant certain people were gifted with power over the reputations of others. And this is where it gets sticky. People often sought healing from conjure doctors because they believed that someone hating had put the roots on them. Roots made for good excuses, especially when an enslaved person had a pleasant view of their white enslaver. This is despite the poor conditions of slavery that bred a higher infant mortality rate, malnutrition, high blood pressure, unsafe conditions, overwork, and everything in between. Sickness and injury 
history became so intertwined with alleged roots and negative energy that a former enslaved man and pastor Irving E. Lowry remarked that the slaves very often connected sickness and death with voodooism or conjuration. Early 20th century white supremacist and historian Myrtle Lockett Avery wrote, Negroes are not necessarily loyal as a race. They fear each other, dread covert acts of vengeance, and being conjured. Does this sound familiar? Just, just a little bit? While enslaved narratives offer conflicting views about the reality of conjuring, conjuring beliefs were more common than not, and paranoia abounded. Lots of WPA narratives feature people saying someone jealous or angry about their success caused them to become sick or fall on hard times, which is frighteningly similar to modern statements about having haters plotting on your downfall. During and after enslavement, black people's inadequate health care, infant mortality, loss of employment or housing, and other systemic issues were blamed on conjure or roots, rather than white supremacy and the extremely unforgivable sin of not providing reparations. One woman was accused of fixing her neighbor and was said to have been envious of another woman who had provided nice clothes and dancing lessons for her child, highlighting classism and inadequate resources. Another woman believed she had been conjured because her straight hair was desired by most females, highlighting featureism and internalized misogyny. The power that conjurers wielded, both perceived and via influence, was also dangerous to white enslavers. Conjurers played key roles in multiple enslaved rebellions from the revolution in Haiti to Peter the Doctor of the 1712 New York City Enslaved Rebellion, who rubbed magic powder on rebels. As much of their food and drink were prepared by the people they callously dehumanized and bought and sold, whites were always terrified of poisonings, which were frequently linked to black conjuring, provoking South Carolina to create a law in 1751 that banned the enslaved from teaching others about the knowledge of any poisonous root, plant herb, or other poison, with the punishment being death. But what about Louisiana and voodoo, which inspired the word hoodoo, but is not the same thing? Back in Africa, voodoo was the religion of tribes living in present-day Benin, or Dahomey of West Africa. It was also practiced amongst people in modern-day Togo, Ghana, and Nigeria. They took their beliefs, particularly worship of the ancestors, with them to Haiti and the Caribbean when sold into slavery, creating the Afro culture and religion voodoo, which incorporated the Orisha, or spirit sent by the Supreme Creator. The religion grew in the absence of white colonizers after the Haitian Revolution ended in 1804. In Spanish and French New Orleans, meanwhile, West Africans had been developing their own culture since 1719, known as voodoo, which I know is confusing, but it was different. And they did this with way less connections to African divinities because of the presence of whites. In 1809, approximately 10,000 Haitians arrived to New Orleans and changed the city's demographics. And their voodoo fused with voodoo to become voodoo. AKA the Afro-Creole counterculture in Southern Louisiana and a common term for African diaspora beliefs of magical practices. Because voodoo ceremonies had empowered Haiti's enslaved population to fight back, it became synonymous with enslavers' worst fears about slave superstitions and possible violent conspiracies. In 1817, the city of New Orleans authorized Congo Square, which contained the city's enslaved population on their Sundays off. This was for surveillance, making sure the voodoo practitioners who were often there surrounded by dancing, eating, and drinking weren't going to harm the city, the slave trade, or the elite. One of the most famed practitioners of all time, Marie Laveau, was known to work her skills at Congo Square. Well, she and her daughter, the second Marie Laveau. Marie, one, earned a reputation of being able to harm people and protect people from harm with her rituals, specializing in romance and business quarrels. As a hairdresser, gossip and client coaxing made her able to appear all-knowing and ultimately a very powerful harborer of secrets for the New Orleans elite. Whites and blacks alike would go to her for business. Judges wanting to win elections, a woman wanting to discredit another woman for the attention of a man, she did it all. However, she usually charged whites and helped black people for free. Her daughter, Marie II, followed in her mother's footsteps by becoming a voodoo priestess. Whereas Marie I was usually kind and only vindictive when the situation called for it, Marie II allegedly relied on the fear of her subjects to remain in control, though she reportedly provided aid during the yellow fever epidemic of 1870. She would prove to be adept at voodoo spectacles, however. Even though Marie One died on June 16, 1881 at the alleged age of 98, sightings of the voodoo priestess would continue to be seen for years to come. Some of these can be attributed to Marie Two, who 
didn't die until the 1890s. However, sightings of Marie Laveau continued until as late as 1918. Urban legend says that drawing an X on Laveau's tomb and leaving an offering of money, candy, or white rum three times will earn you a free wish from her. By the way, Laveau never sat for a painter or had her picture taken, and this portrait regularly used for her is not actually her. Throughout the late 19th century, voodoo was sensationalized. Nationwide after enslavement, when Reconstruction was a hotly debated political issue, newspapers began describing hoodoo and voodoo in frightening terms. Said one in 1873, voodooism is simply the worship of the devil. In Louisiana, accounts of white journalists experiencing wild orgies and voodoo at St. John's Eve ceremonies around the bayous of Lake Pontchartrain began in 1869. While voodoo practitioners were making a killing from the white thrill seekers who watched the dancing, drank alcohol, bought coffee and gumbo, and sometimes sex, stories about what went down were partly fabricated and featured things from interracial orgies to cannibalism. Male voodoo practitioners were also linked to rape in the white media from the 1870s to 1880s. Wrote one New Orleans news editor in a story about voodoo, the Negroes of Haiti have had the absolute government of themselves for three quarters of a century, and every desirable element of civilization almost has been wiped out in the decadence of the island under Negro rule. Failing to mention Haiti's massive debt to France and international embargo and sanctions. Expounded another, documented by Michelle Y. Gordon, voodoo was proof that without the influence of slavery, Haitians fall back upon the superstitions and habits of their ancestors. Black newspapers warned that white ones were intentionally distorting stories about voodoo to foster mistrust and disgust of black people. As Reconstruction ended, black voter registration plummeted and white supremacist Democrats consolidated by the end of the century. And those wild voodoo ceremony news stories faded and were only brought up as proof of Reconstruction's failings. In the years to come, voodoo, the religion and culture, would come to be erroneously conflated with hoodoo. When Northerners came down to the South between 1861 and 1875, teachers, clergy, cultural reformers, many were more keen to offer religiosity than material aid. While judging black Americans as inferior beings who could be polished up with education and opportunity but still be second class citizens, they also considered conjure to be evil, implying that they believed it to be real and superstition as proof of inferiority. They claimed the black pastors who wielded massive amounts of power were too lenient about supernatural stuff. And incorporating conjure into their congregations. There were black people saying this too, believing that belief in root work and the supernatural ruined the odds of racial progress. So conversations about black witchcraft were wrapped up in respectability politics. Said Octavia Rogers Albert, yes, the vice of voodooism which is practiced among the colored people is the result of ignorance and slavery. They will, in the course of time, ignore such doctrine, for they are being educated and the time will come with such simple and nonsensical teachings will find no place among them. Hampton Institute said Samuel Chapman Armstrong began studying superstition and folk belief among black people in 1878, in the process calling out students at Hampton who admitted to believing in conjure. In 1893, the students and teachers created the first black folklore society to document and study black beliefs, though it only lasted until 1899. The rise of black American Christianity outside the bonds of slavery, when paired with respectability politics, only made conjure and superstitions, and by association any remnants of African religions and divinities seem not only like an impediment to the progression of the race, but evil. Years down the line, it's why so many black people in the modern day weren't allowed to watch or read media with witchcraft, but could watch all the hood classics. Like I remember going to a girl's house when I was younger and we were allowed to watch Friday, but not allowed to watch Harry Potter. And it also trickled down to why people who pay homage to our ancestors or who are interested in African conjure traditions are called demon worshipers. So clearly the belief in conjure and people with the power would remain creating divergent groups of those who dabbled in it, downright feared it and called it evil, or simply ignored it. Meanwhile, African-American conjuring and superstition will become frequent literary devices in black literature, like The Conjure Woman, an 1899 collection of short stories by Charles Chestnut, an author and pillar of the black Cleveland community who could pass as a white man but chose not to. His stories were inspired by tales about conjure women in North Carolina. In one, a woman named Aunt Peggy the Conjure Woman curses the soup of a cruel enslaver named Mars Jeans and turns him into his worst nightmare, a black man. He's forced to be a slave 
leave and then turned back, which ultimately changes his behavior. So fast forward to the beginning of the era of the Great Migration, when a flow of six million black people began leaving the South to go north and west, taking their traditions and stories with them. Conjure and hoodoo will become a popular topic in the emerging blues genre too. Sang Ma Rainey and Black Dust Blues, it was way last year when my trouble began. I had done quarreled with a woman. She said I took her man. She sent me a letter, said she's gonna turn me round. She's gonna fix me up so I won't chase her man around. I began to feel bad, worse than I ever before. Lord, I was out one morning, found black dust all around my floor. Speaking of blues, in Memphis, the city gained a reputation for its hoodoo practitioners and product manufacturers. Robert Church, the first black multimillionaire, bought land on Beale Street for a park, auditorium, recreational center, and hotel. It is along this corridor of Beale that black Memphis culture, food, music, and even hoodoo blossomed. Along Beale Street, you could purchase black cat bones and mojo bags from secret back rooms. Lily Mae Glover, who was known as Ma Rainey too, was known for her mojo bags, filling them with sugar, flour, and a heap of coal. Gold miners would ask Beale Street practitioners to give them guidance to find fortune in the Mississippi River. Over time, the thriving industry was targeted because the growing presence of spiritual doctors and conjurers would be perceived as a threat to outsiders who viewed the culture as a haven for deviants and criminals. There would be freaked out news editorials and raids on conjurers and frequent arrests. And to learn more about Memphis's special history with hoodoo, check out this book by Tony Kale. Down in New Orleans, the Cracker Jack drugstore was one of many that sold all kinds of magical items. Though the Cracker Jack thrived in the Black South Rampart Street neighborhood from the late 1800s to the 1970s, and even offered a root guide to curing yourself of syphilis and gonorrhea. It was owned by a white man, however, but that was the new world of hoodoo. By the 1920s, customers could buy charms, candles, powders, and roots from catalogs and white stores who were appropriating hoodoo cures and culture. The aforementioned mojo bag was stripped of its cultural context and the word mojo, which descends from the Fulani word makoko for medicine man, became a slang term for sexual virility after its use in blues and jazz. The John the Conqueror root, whose name came from a black folk hero, became commercial products with white men on them. These practices were everywhere, especially after the Great Migration. Black newspapers like the Chicago Defender frequently published ads by conjure workers, fortune tellers, spiritual advisors, mediums, prophets, and healers, many preying on newcomers who wanted jobs, love, good fortune, or even luck in the thriving numbers racket that would emerge in the 1920s. In Harlem alone, by 1925, there were 30 black banks doing numbers bets, and plenty of conjurers advertised their charm services. Clairvoyants sold lucky numbers for anywhere from 10 to 25 cents, and gamblers could even get spiritual guidance for one to three dollars a session. Like other cities, Harlem was filled with hustlers, and it was hard to tell them apart from the righteous, which is why a new magic industry flourished, one that was completely different from the conjuring of enslavement. In LaShawn Harris's excellent book, Sex Workers, Sidekicks, and Number Runners, there were religious and mystical black women who mixed hoodoo and Pentecostalism, like Reverend Josephine Betcon and Rosa Artemis Horn, who I can't find pictures of with their mysterious asses. Horn was a radio evangelist who claimed to make the blind see and heal the sick and lonely, perfect for people who feared the racist medical field and white doctors. Conjure doctors claimed to reportedly heal everything, including serious disease and ailments like tuberculosis. Black women turned their homes or small retail spaces into temples and seance gatherings where they could make money through honest belief in their powers or by scamming. The writer and poet Claude McKay attended one, noting that the priestess, whose walls included words like love and live, was tipped five dollars each by attendees and encouraged to give more for good spirits. These women sold incenses, candles, body crystals, dried leaves, figs, flowers, and jars of lotions, powders, oils, and spray, with labels offering strong love, domination, peaceful home, money jackpot, get away evil, court case, and death onto my enemy. Chow, not death, damn. Reverend VDS Armistead, founder of the first Holy Star Psychic Science Church, which totally sounds made up, cause it is, sold prosperity oil for 10 cents to $1 a bottle. And I don't have a picture of her either, so you gotta imagine what she looked like. Some, like Dorothy Madam Fufatom Matthews, a Jamaican-born Chinese and black woman who owned a candle shop, sold dream books. She evoked the mammy stereotype on the book's cover, 
hearkening back to old Aunt Dinah. On January 19, 1938, the numbers queen of Harlem, Stephanie St. Clair, shot her husband, Sufi Abdul Hamid. He was a prominent black anti-Semite, cult leader, and pro-black capitalist. She alleged he cheated on her with a conjure woman from Jamaica. That woman was Madame Fu Fatam, who married Hamid three months later. He mysteriously died in a plane crash just four months after that in August, leaving Futam with all of his money. They had opened the Universal Holy Temple of Tranquility and utilized Asian mysticism and Buddhism, but under Futam, who claimed Hamid would come back from the dead in 60 days, the cult ended. As Harris pointed out, this was part of a larger trend of black supernatural consultants adopting Asian motifs to appear exotic and more powerful, and also for respect from white people. Because New York was full of immigrants, others utilized their Caribbean roots to incorporate elements of voodoo, even if they had no power or idea what they were doing. But not everybody was putting on an act. In 1931's Hoodoo in America, Zora Neale Hurston, who studied voodoo in the Caribbean and was one of the few prominent academics defending magic, wrote one becomes a hoodoo doctor in one of three ways, by heredity, by serving an apprenticeship under an established practitioner, or by the call. The most influential doctors seem to be born to the cult. But the money called to the fakers. The New York Amsterdam News reported on a bunch of scam artists, but many were experts at convincing their marks that they just hadn't done the right spell work or applied their oil correctly. By the time Madame Fu Fatam was taking over as the leader of the soon-to-be-closed temple in her husband's estate, New York was seeking to crack down on the magic industry, which was crucial to Harlem's informal economy in the midst of the Great Depression. People were desperate. In 1937, CBS produced a film on Harlem alleging that nearly one-third of Harlem's Negroes have become voodoo worshippers. It claimed that voodoo racketeers weren't deterred by those seeking to root them out. Harlem mystics adopt a new strategy, masquerade as Christian clergymen, and the back rooms in Harlem continues in all its primitive savagery and superstition, the witchcraft of the African Congo. The Harlem's 300,000 Negroes are deeply religious, with an incredible assortment of creeds and denominations. In addition to their religious beliefs, Harlem's people have a childlike faith in spirits and spiritualism. Depression years stimulated Harlem's interest in the occult. Hundreds sought the advice of mystics in the hope of picking winning numbers in the widespread policy racket. Others, seeking to improve their fortunes, go to secret meetings in dingy Harlem flats. Join a cult whose roots go back to darkest Africa. Exotic, barbaric, the cult of voodoo. <laughs> So in addition to falsely reporting on what voodoo actually is, that documentary pissed off black New Yorkers like clergy leaders and the NAACP. Adam Clayton Powell Sr. denounced supernatural believers and practitioners. And cops increasingly began charging conjurers with illegally practicing medicine without a license. The Food, Drugs, and Cosmetics Act of 1938 led to more arrests. Fortune telling could earn a person a disorderly conduct charge. And by the mid-1930s, by the way, at least 19 American cities had laws prohibiting prohibiting fortune telling, which became a misdemeanor in New York subject to a $500 fine or 90 days in jail in 1967. When talking to my family members about this video topic, I asked them about their experiences with root workers growing up. Both of my grandparents, reared as Christians in the most rural parts of North and South Carolina in the 1950s, heard about people who were rumored to dabble in conjuring, from side chicks putting roots on wives, to women whispering about menstrual blood and spaghetti sauce, to knowing people who took trips to fortune tellers. In rural areas, hoodoo and conjure tradition would definitely remain. Overall, however, women in these professions existed in some shape or form in the later half of the century, but less prominently so. Superstition, while still around in various ways, mostly became overshadowed by literacy, education, religion, and mainstream culture. As society became slightly more equitable and more black Americans gained access to the American dream, the need for a belief in a system that granted a sense of control in a chaotic and cruel world diminished. That's not to say that black hoodoo practitioners and occult dabblers didn't remain, but that there 
were fewer believers, though more would come around during tough times. Said Ebony Magazine in 1976, would you believe it? Superstition lives. Before diving into the ways in which black Americans were seeking solutions to the hardships of the 1970s in the occult. There were temples that mixed mysticism with metaphysics, leftovers from the 30s and 40s in urban areas. Approximately 200 to 250 people joined a village in South Carolina, practicing the Yoruba religion and rituals that the conservative magazine called Primitive Religion and Witchcraft Rule. Ebony also estimated that out of hundreds of astrologers in Chicago, approximately 70 were black. One woman named Queen Willa Dixon received 20 to 30 clients a day, which she reported allowed her to buy a home and make her house calls in a leather impaneled Cadillac. By the 1990s, belief in most types of the conjuring from the enslavement era in the black American community was associated with bumpkin ignorance or mental illness, and voodoo associated with immigrants. But millions of black Americans believed in astrology, dialed up the fraudulent Miss Cleo on the Psychic Friends Network, which was regularly hosted by Dionne Warwick, and some dabbled in occultism alongside their Christian beliefs. And as for the extremely religious, magic was definitely real, as real as the devil. So real that witchcraft and media was considered demonic and subversive, barring hella black children from any depictions of witchcraft and media. So the belief in magic lingered, and it coexisted with Christian religion and expectations for black people to be modern and westernized Christians, capable of fitting into a white society. Thankfully, my grandparents and mom weren't anti-witchcraft, but I wasn't allowed to watch the hood classics. And the depictions of black witches and the supernatural in media that I saw were The Wiz, Twitches, Angelina Johnson and Harry Potter, and Raven Baxter and That's So Raven. I never saw it, but Whoopi Goldberg played a medium and ghost. And the most serious and culturally significant early depictions of Gullah Geechee Yoruba and Louisiana Hoodoo was 1991's Daughters of the Dust and 1997's Eve's Bayou. If you've never seen Eve's Bayou, this is your sign to go see it now. Depictions of magical black women were rare, and when included, they were often stereotypically Caribbean, had no personal motivations or lacked backstories like Rochelle in The Craft. However, the addition of characters like in season three of American Horror Story, which fictionalized Marie Laveau, played by Angela Bassett, was really cool. And one of my favorite shows of all time, True Blood, there was the shady Miss Jeanette, played by Aisha Hines, and the discovery of Hoodoo by Lafayette Reynolds, played by the late and great Nelson Ellis. More recently, Hoodoo was practiced by the character Diamond in Pea Valley, which was a twist I didn't see coming. On The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, the character Prudence, played by Tati Gabrielle, is one of the practitioners of the European-style demonic witchcraft. That's really all I could think of, even though I bet I'm probably missing a few, and I know y'all gonna tell me. If you have a favorite depiction of black conjure workers, witches, or clairvoyants in media, let me know in the comments. In recent years, black women and femmes have cultivated online communities on conjuration and root work to exchange information and practices and ply their magical skills, from offering readings of celebrities and political events on YouTube to branching into outside traditions like tarot readings. I've got interesting reads gathered for you in the source list on Patreon. And I'll be honest, part of this video was inspired by a tweet I saw where it was somewhere along the lines of, you paid a random from Fiverr to do root work on you and you wonder why your life is in shambles and that made me laugh, but I just had to do a little digging. It was interesting seeing how during enslavement and beyond, magic was used to explain the world as it was for black people. A world where we have been divided against each other, dehumanized, and exploited. This video was also inspired by the never-ending sentiment I've seen and even espoused myself that somebody somewhere is sending negative energy, rooting on someone's downfall, blocking somebody's blessings, putting a root on them, etc. So the most striking part of this research was the recurrent theme of paranoia about evildoers in the black community, and rumors that those who were succeeding while others were failing were dabbling in magic. History really is so cyclical. By a similar token, in modern Africa, who has its own complicated history with colonialism and witchcraft, in the past decade alone, approximately 20,000 people, mostly children, women, the elderly, and people with albinism, have been harmed or murdered because they were believed to be witches. It's most common in places with the 
significant lack of resources where citizens are more likely to seek someone to blame for their chronic and systemic misfortune wrought by white supremacy. Here in the States, like during enslavement, the misfortune of the Great Depression, and scratching for survival in 1970s America, black conjuring and interest in the occult has once again risen in prominence because it can be a limitless source of hope and because more black people than ever before have left the church. It's no wonder that internet gurus with toxic or ill-informed views who happen to tweet positive messages and offer readings or conjuring classes can make big money. Modern obsessions with manifesting, a descendant of the 19th century law of attraction, and a personal habit which I'll never give up because it's free and serotonin boosting and life is hard, honey, may one day be included in a future black historian's essay on black magic culture in the 2020s. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this brief history of black magic and conjuring. There was a bunch more I could have included and this video would have been double the length if I discussed black men and magic, but the sources I've listed on Patreon can help you go deeper if you're so inclined. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you like and subscribe and happy Halloween and I hope you check out a black people's history of Halloween.